I'm going to invite you to take a seat and grab your Bibles or your Bible apps and turn to the book of Romans chapter 13. Romans 13. Uh, if, uh, if, you, if you're at home and you don't have uh, a Bible that you can use, then uh, I'm just going to encourage you to message us because we'd love to send you a Bible or deliver a Bible to you. If you're in the room at Sweetwater, then there's a Bible in the chairs around you. If you're in the room at Parker Campus, then there's a table in the back. And right now, I'm going to encourage you to go get one of those Bibles. And if you're in the rooms, uh, it's page 1127. And as always, if you don't have a Bible and you want one, then please take one of those with you, or as I said before, ask for, us, uh, ask for one from us, and we'll be glad to supply it to you, because we want you to have the Word of God and read the Word of God, because we know if you do that, then God will change your life. Hey, I just got to say, uh, and I know, Parker, uh, this, is, uh, this is Saturday here that I, I'm, I'm preaching this, but uh, the room is filled with people in costumes, and that's a lot of fun. Uh, I just got to tell you, it's, it's interesting to, to see the, the people around the room. And some of you are, are seated next to people that, uh, that uh, do not look normal, and praise God for them. <laughs> okay, just got to say that. Uh, it's a beautiful thing uh, to see. I also know that I just asked you to turn to Romans, and we've been in a series on, on Acts for several months, and we're going to be returning to that series on Acts next week. But... Um, you know, today is, a, this weekend is a special weekend right before an election. And so in a couple of days, Americans are going to go to the polls and make the most important decision in the history of civilization. <laughs> or not. Uh, you know, is, is anyone else tired of the, the rhetoric, the accusations, the political ads, the mailers, the never-ending phone calls, the Facebook feuds? Are, have you, are you sick of the constant barrage of noise telling us what to think and how to vote? I mean, it's in like enough already. I don't know about you, but I am politicked off. Anyone else? You with me on that? I mean, this is crazy. Now, let me just say, if you are a citizen of this country and you are qualified to vote, you should vote. Okay? The, the election's coming up. I, I mean... Uh, we are privileged, I mean absolutely privileged in this country to be able to participate in the democratic process. So I'm going to encourage you to use the influence that God gave you. Okay, that, that is something that is very important to me and, and I hope that uh, it's important to you. And for the record, I will never tell you how to vote. Uh, that's not my job, that's not my calling. Okay, that's not what I want to do. I, look, I have convictions, you have convictions, and if you want to ask me what my convictions are, then buy me lunch and I'll be glad to share them, okay? I might even buy you lunch and share them, but you've, gotta, you've got to initiate that conversation because that doesn't have anything to do with my job or my calling. But today, I want us to examine God's viewpoint. I, I want us to think about how heaven looks at our politics. Uh, and, and I want you to hear the Apostle Paul because he told the Philippian Christians this in uh, chapter 3, verse 20. He said, our citizenship is in heaven. And from it, we await a Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. So if you are a follower of Jesus, if you actually believe that Jesus is the one and only Son of God and Savior of the world, and you believe that he died on the cross to pay for your sins and was raised from the dead, and you have made a commitment to follow Jesus with your life, then I hope you care what God thinks about politics. I hope you care about the heavenly viewpoint uh, since you're a citizen of heaven. And so uh, we're going to talk about that. And by the way, if you're not yet a follower of Jesus Christ, you haven't made that decision to surrender your life to him and ask him to be your savior, uh, this may give you some insight as well. So uh, Romans chapter 13, I'm going to read just a, a few verses here uh, at the beginning of this chapter, and I want you to hear this, when, and we're going to refer back to it. The Apostle Paul says, let every person be subject to the governing authorities, for there is no authority except from God, and those that exist have been instituted by God. Therefore, whoever resists the authorities resists what God has appointed, and those who resist will incur judgment. For rulers are not a terror to good conduct, but to bad. Would you have no fear of the one who is in authority? Then do what is good, and you will receive his approval. For he is God's servant for your good. 
But if you do wrong, be afraid, for he does not bear the sword in vain, for he is a servant of God, an avenger, who carries out God's wrath on the wrongdoer. Uh, the first thing I want you to know from, from uh, God's perspective on our politics is that God is not a member of any political party. God is not a member of any political party. God does not endorse any candidate for president. God does not support or favor Democrats, Republicans, Socialists, or Libertarians. For the record, this may surprise you, God isn't even an American. Okay? Uh, Jesus is the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. All right? He is above the President of the United States, drastically so. And, and Scripture tells us that one day everyone will bow before Jesus. Republicans, Democrats, Socialists, Communists, even atheists. Everyone. So please do not equate Jesus with a party, unless, of course, it's a wedding party, like the wedding party of the Lamb. You see, the kingdom of God is not about politics. It's about people. Because Jesus died to redeem people from every tribe, every language, every group, every nation. That's what he's about. He's about people, wanting to redeem people. And, and so Jesus doesn't endorse a party or a candidate. In fact, Jesus is looking for people who will endorse, support, and serve him. See, um, in other words, Jesus is looking for followers not candidates. Uh, we get that confused a lot. I don't know if you guys have noticed. I don't know if you've listened. Uh, but there's a lot of you can't be a Christian and vote for this or can't be a Christian and vote for that. I've actually heard both parties using that line, people who support both candidates using that line. And uh, let me just tell you something. Uh, all of that's false. And, and we want to follow Jesus and we want to be his followers, not ask Jesus to support what we want. So let me ask you this question. Are you supporting Jesus or, or are you asking Jesus to support your candidate? Are you surrendered to God's will or are you negotiating with God on what you want to see happen? Uh, that's a question a lot of us need to wrestle with in this season. And by the way, in case you're wondering, this is a sermon I'm preaching to myself, okay? Because I need to hear this too. Uh, so, first thing is, God is not a part of a political party. Second thing I want you to see is that whoever God votes for will win. Okay? Did you catch this? This is like a, a so clear statement that I have had people in this church argue with me about, even though Paul says it very clearly. Romans 13, 1, let every person be subject to the governing authorities. Get this. For there is no authority except from God, and those that exist have been instituted by God. So I just want you to know that whoever God votes for will win. Because according to Scripture, who is it that establishes all authority? It's not a trick question. You guys got it right. How come this side of the room answered and this side didn't? So I don't, you guys were all like, you're going to hold us, you're going to grade now. I'm not grading you. So here's the thing. God knows who's going to win the election. I was talking to him a little while ago. He did not tell me what the answer was. <laughs> because God is the one who institutes authorities. God decides the election. And this is such a difficult truth for us to hold on to. Now, let me qualify that. It's really an easy truth if your candidate wins. <laughs> See, God voted for my candidate. That's right. I'm on God's side. But if your candidate happens to lose, it's really hard truth to handle, isn't it? Because there's going to be about uh, half the country on Wednesday or Thursday or December, or whenever the election's decided, <laughs> that is going to be wrestling with... You know, how did, why did God not choose my guy? Why, why, why not? Because let's face it, half the country is going to be celebrating and half the country is going to be grieving. See, the reality is God knows what he's doing. Always. And, and we try to figure it out. So let me just tell you the options here. Perhaps God is trying to bless our country by who wins the election. Or perhaps 
God wants to judge our country by who wins the election. I don't know if you guys are familiar with this Old Testament story, but God used an evil king named Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, to destroy Jerusalem because the people of Jerusalem were being disobedient to God, and God used an, an evil king to destroy them, destroy the temple, carry them off into captivity, do all this kind of stuff because God wanted to get the attention of his people. Sometimes God still does that. Or perhaps God is just letting our nation reap what we have sown. You know, reaping what you sow is an inescapable uh, principle in your life personally. You are going to reap what you sow. That's why you want to sow to the Spirit and from the Spirit reap eternal life. But if you sow to the flesh, from the flesh you're going to reap destruction. If we as a nation choose to sow to the flesh long enough, we're going to reap destruction. That, that's just reality. And um, if you read again the Old Testament... The, the kingdoms of Judah and Israel had many more bad kings than good kings. And they were God's chosen people. So uh, whatever the purpose that God has, just know that God never loses elections. Ever. Can't happen. God will accomplish his purposes in this world and God will redeem through any circumstances even if we cannot see how. So take heart, because no matter who wins, God is in control of the people in control. Let me say that again. No matter who wins, God is in control of the people who are in control. That, that's an absolute truth. Now, some people struggle to believe this because of the evil in this world that is perpetrated by rulers and governments. And we're not blind to that. But, but be clear on this. God does not approve the evil actions of men. God redeems the actions of evil men. God doesn't approve, but God redeems. Two real world, real time examples right now today. And I mentioned these a couple of weeks ago. Uh, China has been officially communist atheist for 71 years. And yet the church in China is growing tremendously. And in not too distant future, there's going to be more Christians in China than any nation in the world. That's crazy. That's how God redeems an evil government that is oppressing and persecuting its people who want to worship Jesus. Another example, according to Operation World, which is a Christian ministry uh, working with uh, uh, developing nations around the world with the uh, church in those, says that the two fastest growing churches or countries that have the fastest growing churches in the world are Iran and Afghanistan. Iran and Afghanistan have more people, percentage-wise, coming to Jesus right now than any other nations on the face of the earth. In those countries, it is illegal to convert to Christianity. And if they catch you, it's punishable by death. Now, those are evil rulers, and yet the gospel is spreading and growing because God redeems and God is in control of the people in control. So uh, whoever God votes for is going to win uh, the election. Final thing I, I want you to see and understand in this is that our mission is to expand God's kingdom, not our political influence. Now, think about this. Our mission is to expand God's kingdom, not our political influence. Uh, now, you may or may not know this, but Jesus lived in a politically charged time in history. Uh, the, the Jewish homeland was occupied by Romans. Roman Empire had conquered uh, that whole area of Judea, Palestine, as it's called today, uh, the nation of Israel now. They, they'd conquered that, and so the, the Jewish people lived under the, the oppression of Rome, and Rome did what it wanted. The governors there were Roman. They taxed the people. They had to follow Roman laws, all this kind of stuff. So, uh, the, the, and the Jewish people hated that, and, and so they wanted a political messiah. They wanted somebody to lead them to freedom, to uh, throw off the oppression of Rome, and to, to lead a rebellion. They wanted a political messiah. We would never want that, now would we? We never look for that political messiah. 
See, it was so bad, the Romans finally destroyed the city of Jerusalem in 70 AD. I mean, they got so upset, so sick and tired of the constant rebellions and problems uh, of uh, Israel that they sent the army there and they tore Jerusalem apart stone by stone. Just wiped the city out. No one's going to live here. It's not going to be a city anymore. That's how upset they were. Now, that's the, that's the time that Jesus lived in, and yet Jesus almost never spoke to politics. Uh, now, he did occasionally because they tried to trap him one time, and they said, hey, Jesus, uh, what do you think about paying taxes? Jesus said, show me a coin. They showed him a coin. He said, whose image is on the coin? They said, Caesar. And he said, then render unto Caesar what is Caesar's, render to God what's God's. Another political comment he made, he's on trial before Pontius Pilate, the Roman governor, and, the Roman go and Jesus is accused of being a king that's leading a rebellion. And Pontius Pilate says, are you a king? And Jesus says, my kingdom is not of this world. Okay, those are political statements. That, those are the things that he said. Uh, he, he didn't talk a lot about politics. So what did Jesus do? He focused on the mission. He focused on the mission. He said the Son of Man came to seek and to save the lost. That's what he was about. He wanted to seek and to save the lost. So Jesus allowed a corrupt political religious group to arrest him and hand him over to a corrupt politician who declared Jesus innocent and then handed him over to be executed. That's what Jesus did. Remember, God's in control, the people in control. And that was part of God's plan. And why did Jesus do that? He did that because he wanted to save us from our sins. He wanted to redeem our lives. He wanted to deliver us from hell. He wanted to give us the hope of heaven. He wanted to defeat death completely. That's why Jesus did that. So please understand this. No matter who wins the election, God's eternal purpose of changing lives continues. That's why the mission of Calvary is to lead people to a life-changing relationship with Jesus. And it doesn't matter whether the people are Democrats or Republicans or anarchists. We want to lead them to a life-changing relationship with Jesus. It doesn't matter if the people are celebrating the election results or grieving the election results. We want to lead them to a life-changing relationship with Jesus. It doesn't matter if times are good or bad, if the economy is thriving or in recession. It doesn't matter if the world is at war or at peace. The mission remains the same. We want to lead people to a life-changing relationship with the Son of God, the Savior of the world, Jesus Christ. Because He is the only one who can forgive sins. He's the only one who can change our lives. He's the only one who can take us to heaven. He's the only one who can save us. And if we remember that, and if we remember that God is for us, therefore it doesn't matter who's against us, then we can rejoice no matter what. You see, our God and our mission remain the same, regardless of the outcome Tuesday night or whenever it's decided. Psalm 20, the psalmist declares, some trust in chariots, some trust in horses, but we trust in the name of the Lord our God. That is such a beautiful verse. Some trust in chariots, some in horses. We trust in the name of the Lord our God. So um, I'm going to vote. Oh, well, actually, I already have. How, how many of you have already voted? Okay. Those of you who didn't raise your hands, just got a couple of days. So make it count. Um, and... and and I want my candidate to win, just like you want your candidate to win. Right? You know, we're honest about that. But today, are you placing your trust and your hope in a person to be elected president, or are you trusting in the living God who saves? Let me say that again. Are you, are you placing your hope and your trust in who's going to win an election, or are you trust, placing your trust and your hope in the God who is alive and who saves and who lives and reigns forevermore? Because I want you to walk out of here or finish your evening watching this at home and have peace that passes understanding. Because whatever the outcome is Tuesday night, Jesus Christ 
is Lord. Jesus is King of kings and he's Lord of lords. And if you belong to him, you can lose an election, but you still win. See, this is his world and we're his people. And here's the thing, we are called by God to make a difference in this world. We've been entrusted with the good news of love, that God loves everybody, that there's mercy and forgiveness available to everyone who calls on the name of Jesus. We have the hope of eternal life and life change in this world. And we have been commissioned by our Savior to love people relentlessly. So I've decided that even though some may trust in chariots and some in horses, I'm going to trust in the name of the Lord, my God. Who are you going to trust? Let's pray. Father, we know that you are good. We know that you have loved us and demonstrated that love in the sacrifice of your son, Jesus who gave his life on the cross to pay for our sins, was raised from the dead so that we could understand that that resurrection is part of the promise. You've, you've guaranteed our salvation and said that heaven is where we're going to live forever in your presence, where there's no more suffering or sorrow or death or pain or politics. But right now we're living in a world that is torn apart by politics. So God, I pray that you'd give us peace. That, uh, that you would help us to, to face our, our day today and tomorrow and the next day and our future as your children with faith, with hope, with joy, no matter the outcome of temporary elections, whether policies are what we want or what we despise, uh, God, we want to live for you. We want to speak truth. We want to demonstrate love to everybody that we meet whether they are kind or whether they are evil. We want to be your representatives in this world. We want to be on mission for Jesus. So God, we give ourselves to you because Jesus Christ is alive. He's risen from the dead and he is one. And we are followers of the king above all kings. It's in the name of Jesus that we pray. Amen.